Uh, welcome all to the uh, BCS webinar series. This is the second one in our series of um, key IT workers, how to cope with long-term home working. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our panel, who I'm sure you can see in front of you. We've got Yasin Kunta, who's uh, a futurologist and play expert. Thank you for leaving, uh, Yasin. A long-term expert with um, dealing with distributed teams. You have uh, Rabina Chatham, BCS author, the art of IT management. Hello, Rabina. And we've got Ruby Kaur, Senior Architect at Vodafone. Welcome, Ruby. So we've got a very wide uh, selection of, 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 of angles here on this subject, which of course is important. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to talk about uh, two things. Uh, the first one is the Vital IT Workers campaign itself. Now, um, we're just trying to highlight, as it says here, the, the great contribution IT professionals are making at the moment. Obviously, it's unprecedented times. Um, as an IT journalist, I've known for years that IT departments tend to take fall for all sorts of things. In fact, one of the greatest strains of, of, of coverage there's been in recent years is every time a project goes wrong, it seems to be IT that gets the blame. Well, now we're in a situation where IT is supporting a lot of things in, in quite a resilient way, uh, by and large. So we just want to call out those that are doing great work. So uh, Vital IT Workers is the uh, hashtag. Please um, talk about people that you think just deserve a, a call out. Uh, there's many doing a lot of good work right now. Uh, the other thing uh, just to draw your attention to, on the uh, controls for GoToWebinar, you'll see a little section marked questions. If you have a question uh, for our experts here, we're going we're gonna to talk for about half an hour, and then we're going to have 15 minutes or so of questions. So please put your questions in there. You can do it as we go, uh, and uh, hopefully we can uh, catch up with some of those as well. So how to cope with long-term working from home then? As I've already alluded to, uh, we've had a huge change in, in the focus of our lives just recently, haven't we? Uh, this home focus. Uh, but pressures will change, obviously, as, as time goes on with that. So our first discussion point is this. What longer-term issues will arise? And we can look at some of the benefits as well. So who'd like to kick us up there? Perhaps we could ask Rubina just um, uh, that first question. Okay. Um, well, when we come out the other side of this, I don't think things are going to be quite the same again. And I would anticipate that a lot more people are going to start, well, carry on working from home. That this may have set the bar. And I think in the past, sometimes people have been reluctant to work from home because they felt it might adversely in fact impact their career. And I think that will change, that people will decide it's okay. I think companies will decide it's possibly cheaper and will lead less, less sort of premises and, and real estate. Um, mm. And it, it, some companies might have had to sell buildings in order to survive the crisis. So I think we'll see a lot long-term home working. Um, for me, I've got a really awful internet connection because I live in the middle of the sticks. <laughs> and I think hopefully <laughs> um, we'll have sort of better internet connections throughout the country in due course. But I think that will take time to get there. Um, and the thing I'm suffering with at the moment is what I call the work-life boundary. Mm. And I'm used to doing stuff at home, but my husband is not. So it's a bit like having a teenager around with attention deficit syndrome because he can't work from home. So I've got him permanently interrupting me um or getting fed up with me because i'm sitting in my office in front of the screen and he wants to go for a bike ride or he wants me to sit down and watch the tv with him so oh, yeah. that's a bit of a challenge at, at the moment well perhaps we'll see him um, a bit later <laughs> <laughs> yeah you might see the cat actually <laughs> Uh, so Yassine, can I, can I turn to you? You've had quite a lot of experience uh, over the years in working with distributed teams. What's your perception on the longer term issues that will arise? Um, I mean, I, I worked with teams uh, in the, I mean, like, for example, it's been, this is my fifth, tenth year actually working from home. So I'm very much used to working remotely and as a satellite. So I think you learn um, how to kind of adjust yourself with the timelines also. That's the most important thing, especially if you are working with overseas and different kind of timelines. And um, that you have to always remind the other people that you know you are either behind or you are you know uh, ahead of them. 
um, you get used to saying things in kind of in very much detailed because before if you are in the office you know that you will be there at a certain time period so you kind of you take it for granted but when yeah. you are remote you have to actually make it sure what time and where and how it is actually different for them you have to underline those kind of things um, the biggest other problem which I had before was um, for example in the um, any kind of telephone conferences or uh, video conferences people forget how to speak to the uh, microphone and they forget that you are there <laughs> and then they start to talk a lot and because of the interface you know the um, when somebody else is talking the other person cannot be heard so that's the part which you need to learn how to listen to other people um, I think that kind of is a mindset and then the other thing is because you are not in the same place you don't see people's reactions I mean you are not used to seeing people's reactions mm. in real time um, in this one but you learn I mean you learn how to read people's uh, you know um, face expressions and how they are feeling how they are using their voice uh, you learn to listen small details so because it's not anymore in the same place so those are the yeah. things probably is going to become a little bit hard in the beginning you get excited because that's new but in in the long time you learn there are some kind of things that you need to adjust and you need to get some new skills with, with that um, and also mm. how do you create humor between that kind of relationship how do you become comfortable those are really going to be important i think and Ruby, you've got a perspective. Obviously, you work in a very large organization. What, what's your views on, on, on how this is progressing? Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, Brian. Hi, everyone. Um, well, my view is I've been a veteran of home working. I've done it for about nearly 20 years off and on now. So I've certainly developed new skills and there are a lot of new skills that you need. Um, but the things that I would think are the issues that I think in those 20 years I've seen bubble up and are still there is that we really have to get a balance and a check in with our mental and um, physical and social and emotional well-being throughout this because we've, we've heard Rabina speak that you know it's difficult to have that work-life balance boundary and so we're constantly looking at a screen all the time and you often feel as though you have to contribute all the time because you're online mm -hmm. if you're not online and you're not contributing because you're trying to make up for the fact that you're not present you're not physically there in an office so you have to work towards different skills which is being more visible in a different way and whether in large organizations like in Vodafone where we have Office 365 and we have collaboration tools we have unified communications tools all of those are letting us contribute in some way so that's that kind of mindset where we say we must keep contributing all the time and that can start to have a bit of a payload on us all the time so our, our physical our emotional our mental well-being can start to suffer slightly um, or in a in a very drastic fashion now these are not unsurmountable problems we can actually get over these by um, stepping away having those boundaries taking up different hobbies that we could do um, and i also think one other key thing i've learned from a lot of homeworking is that we don't stay in the same job forever we move on therefore we need to demonstrate new talents and we need to build trust with our employees as well and trust is quite a difficult thing to build unless you've been physically present with people so those are the new skills that how to build up trust with your employee how to actually look for new talent as well when you need new people to join your team being remote and working flexibly is going to be a bit of a challenge but they're not unsurmountable i think we can get over these things so let's uh, look specifically different perspectives so uh, rabin obviously you've written about this uh, subject at um some length what are some of the issues we're going to face with 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 management what are some of the ameliorations we could have um well as ruby mentioned i think it's very difficult to build um trust-based relationships remotely um you know if you've got a relationship in the first place it's a lot easier to maintain that remotely but building that relationship in the first place is really really difficult and 
Um, indeed, I had a one-to-one -one coaching session yesterday, which ideally I do face-to-face, -face, but that wasn't an option, so we did it online. Mm. And he, he was facing a particular issue um, with somebody that was undermining him at work. And my normal advice would have been to uh, probably go down the pub and have a real off the record, face to face, cards on the table chat, which is not something you can do online. So I think this whole thing of building trust based relationships is going to be a real challenge. And I don't have the answers. Um, you know, I've always recommended do this stuff face to face. Um, mm. Hopefully, down the road, we will be able to do some face to face, but probably it will be different to before um, coronavirus times. Um, and I don't have the answers, and I think we will have to develop new skills. And I don't really know what those are at the moment. Um, work in progress, I'd say. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Yassine, what's your view on, on that, the, the sort of management angle? Um, I have worked with people that I've never met and for years I worked with them. So it's, I think it depends. The trust is a different way of working in that sense. I mean, I worked with engineers especially and they were already very much introverted people. So it was very easy to create a trust between us because if you say, if you do something and they, uh, they understand and they do it. So it's kind of slowly builds up that relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, we never had that kind of, I mean, you would have like a small talk in the beginning of any conversation where you start to work, but it's usually business based and subject based. So it kind of always evolved around that, which made it easier to actually create that relationship. Um, yeah, I mean, I have, I have so many people that I never met. Um, they are like really far away. I have no idea how they are in real time. But, okay. Yeah. Interesting. What's your perspective on that one, Ruby? Yeah, very good points. Um, I think today we do have an online presence and we have an offline presence. Okay. And as the decades go on, we're getting more and more to be an online person. You know, I have an online mm. presence all the time, you know, and that, that is me <laughs> more than my physical presence. And I think with managers, specifically for that question about management, I think what I've seen work really well is when our leaders um, actually display those attributes, for example, they actually do work from home themselves. So they can actually see that, yes, they have got a home life. They can show compassion that, you know, we're going to get children bursting in or we're going to get, you know, elder care parents that we need to look after. And we start to integrate those into our daily lives. Um, I've always been off this view, having done home working for quite a long time, is that it's not so much of a work-life balance for me. I've started to come around to the idea of work-life blend. I'm blending, I'm meshing lots of uh, boundaries together. Now, that's not everyone's cup of tea, but I'm finding it does help because I can get mm. inspirational from daily life, from the things that I do, making a cup of tea. And I'm integrating that into my work, the thoughts that I have, the innovative experiences I can have. And going back to the idea of being online and offline, I think those are starting to merge as well a little. Um, mm. And of course, there are boundaries with privacy. There are boundaries about our work that we take back. But on the on the leaders, I think if um, companies have very good, well-defined policies in place, which are supported, uh, supportive of home workers, um, no longer are we going to get the idea that presenteeism is everything. You know, you have yeah. to see the whites of people's eyes. I'm very much like Yassim. I work in an international organization, great friends from all around the world, um, never met them. Yet I have built, built that rapport and that trust with those people because of the IT projects we work on. And I think that is becoming more of the norm now to be working in dispersed teams and you have to work at it. You have to work at, you know, your visibility is going to be something different. Um, in Vodafone, we have Office 365. And if we continue to be present on those tools and post, um, you know, little postings of what we're up to and what we're doing, the social collaboration also helps as well. So mm. these are the things that are overcoming me having to be physically in the office. I can still be visible by the things that I use with collaboration tools. 
Well, that, that, those are interesting perspectives. Now, one of the things that um, I'd like to bring up in a moment, we'll talk about the human aspect of this because you know human contact is is the thing that's the most difficult, as we've already sort of mentioned. Really, um, before we get to that, one specific bit of advice I've seen repeated quite a lot over the last few, um, well, last couple of days even, is you can't over communicate. Keep communicating, communicate all the time. I just wonder how. Just put, trying to put myself in the position of somebody that perhaps feels a little bit more in, in terms of emotional or mental pressure, whether that's very good advice. And um, perhaps we could just come with to you, Rabina, on that one. What's your feeling on that kind of advice? Um, well, I believe it's the quality of communication that is important rather than the amount. And, you know, we all need time to get work done. Um, and if we can communicating constantly with everybody, we're not going to have any time to get anything done. So mm. for me, it's, it's quality, not quantity. Um, I, I'm an extrovert, so I like human contact and I like talking to people. And um, statistically, uh, IT people are more introverted than extroverted. So I can get very frustrated when sometimes I want to I want to pick up the phone and talk to somebody and all I get is voicemail and you end up resorting to email communication and then it's very easy for communications to spiral downhill particularly if it's a tricky issue so yes. i think that's one thing that we ought to do at the moment is possibly make ourselves more available on the phone and if the phone rings pick it up not hide behind email um, and i think it's far different i think it's a lot easier to build a relationship on the phone than it is on an email and I'm sure we've all had emails that have made our blood boil and it takes all your will in the world not to fire back a, a response. So, yes. um, you know, I'd rather one phone call than 10 emails. And I think That's I can good... probably achieve more in that one phone call than I can in, you know, lengthy 10 emails, which might even have a, a detrimental effect if the conversation is spiralling downhill. That's interesting. You seem have you found have you found the same thing with your distributed contacts? Um, I think it depends on which culture we are talking about. Every culture has a different way of interacting. For example, I work with Turkish um, clients, and they use all the time WhatsApp. Like they they don't have time. Like they don't have any time. Like they would send information at midnight, and you will be like, okay, and that's their way of communicating it's like you can't email them it doesn't work like that so <laughs> um so it was it's although i'm turkish by the way so it's kind of like a it's a great learning for me how my own culture is actually communicating because i'm very much used to um the western culture style so and it's also depends on which generation we are talking about and how they are actually um comfortable in communicating and you end up getting emails from LinkedIn and then all of a sudden Twitter or the, or Instagram or you know you forget which one you are getting the information from um, and on top of it nowadays it's the social interaction is becoming huge because all of a sudden everybody realized there is Zoom and they want to do hangouts all the time <laughs> so it's kind of like a yeah. how do you how do you really arrange your day because at the end of the day any sound that any thinking comes from outside it, either you are physical or not it takes it consumes time so i do agree the quality of that interaction is very important um so you try to create boundaries depending on who you are dealing and why you are dealing and in which context and that's yeah. really key i think to create the day in a mentally nice organized way a similar for you, Ruby? Well, I work for a communications company, so communication <laughs> is uh, really important, but totally by the point, it's it's got to be quality. Um, it's a bit like Twitter, you know, how do you filter all that noise to get the real crux and the real important information? And I know at work, we're using Workplace um, by Microsoft, by work 
by Facebook rather. And uh, they have come up with a really clever way of any important information that we need that always goes to the very top, you know, off our feeds. So that's more of a posh information coming to us that's very important. So it doesn't get drowned out from all, all the other noise that people are posting about their cats and their dogs and, you know, where they're working today. Mm. Um, so, yes, it's definitely about quality. Um, and I think people are learning that. I, I think the digital native generation are getting very good at this. You know, they they will use the tools more easily. And we have young graduates that join us all the time. And we learn from those guys, you know, how best to use the digital tools, communication tools, U, the UC tools. It's a generation, you know, backflow at the moment. So mm. I, I think that's good. If you can learn internally, you will. Um, I think we're all moving towards trying to ditch email as much. We don't want email to constantly come to us. So I think if we have got those collaboration tools and we do have unified communications integrated with our tools and our business tools at work, that really helps. It does. So, um, yes, you, you have to push out communication all the time, but as long as it's the quality of information and as long as it can be prioritized right to the very top of your to do list, then it really does make a lot of sense. In another context today, I um, saw a comment about reverse mentoring, where um, <laughs> younger ones, perhaps with less experience, mentor uh, people with more experience who perhaps, uh, I think this might work in this particular context, might it? How do you use the yeah, tools that then we could learn yeah. from <laughs> people that are a bit more native to it, perhaps? Um, uh, let's move on to this other subject of uh, the human touch, uh, you know, the, the, the human interaction part. Uh, while well, I'm just changing the slide, um, can I ask Martin to um, uh, just have a look at some of the questions, please? Because I'm having a bit of trouble with my uh, <laughs> with my screens here. Um, and if you've got any questions, folks, please please post them, and Martin will uh, Martin will pick them up. So let's just change the slide here. Uh, let's talk about um, this human angle then, trying to recreate the sort of benefits we get from face to face interaction and, and how we might go about doing that. Um, uh, perhaps start with yourself, Rabina, on that one. You were talking to me about okay. uh, the way we use our cameras, for example. <laughs> yes. Um, well, one thing that, one sort of trick I found that um, when you're using a webinar such as this situation, um, a lot of people will be using a laptop. Um, especially if they're not used to working at home, they'll have brought their laptop home with them. And there's a tendency to, to look um, down at it. And the danger is that we end up looking up somebody's nose, which is possibly not the most attractive look. So if you have, if you are using I'm, a laptop, I'm very conscious of that now. <laughs> yeah, try and put it at eye level. Maybe put it on a couple of books so you're at eye level. Um, another trick I learned was to put it. Um, on a post-it note, draw a smiley face and put it by the camera and that has the okay. impact of helping you, reminding you to keep smiling and showing a little bit of human emotion. Um, I also think it's a good idea to bring, show you as a human being and bring a bit of you into your space. So I think it's quite okay for you know to have pictures on the wall and and show you at home and it doesn't have to be a clinically clean mm. environment and it's okay for kids to rush in and or pets to walk across your screen and that we should try and show ourselves as human beings um, and you know dress more casually and you yes. know not not think about to be suited and be on a on a video and things like that. I I'm way ahead of you there. Yes. <laughs> yes, Ian, how, how do you um, try and maintain? I'm thinking about sort of one thing we, we tend to lack is like chance interaction, isn't it? And, and water cooler moments I've got on the slide. But uh... yeah, um, so, well, I'm a toy designer, so which makes it a little bit easier because I have toys everywhere. And anytime I'm talking about, I do have something on my desk, which I end up showing to who I am talking to right now. For example, I have these cubes and I okay. love them um, so it's kind of makes makes it really like when you start to talk about something that you love it makes it right. much more contagious to the other side and um, and I think uh, people relax 
Um, and also it depends on your relationship with that person. If, if, if you are for the first time meeting, of course, you have to have a big smile and, you know, you have to show kind of like a, how genuine you are and uh, that you are interested in that person that you are meeting and um, asking questions. So it kind of helps uh, to break that screen time in between. Mm. <clears throat> and makes it much more real that is if you are there really for uh, for real um but if you are much more close uh you know you can make even you can create games or you can create some kind of um, um fun things to show them especially imagine that that you are for example talking to your for example i have a nephew and he's in istanbul so you you learn how to interact from the screen with these people, uh, it's it's very hard. Mm. They are, for example, he's two and a half years old. So, how do you actually make yourself there? Is it comes with that humor, and how do you use your face yeah. expression? It's kind of like a theater. So, I think we okay. need to remember that we need to do a bit more exaggeration, so that it becomes real. I think. Well, thank you for demonstrating that practically. So, let me um, let me uh, follow up with. Uh, I'll just show you this. <laughs> This is a um, it's a fossil. Can you see that's a black um, fossil dinosaur bone that is that we oh, found at the Lyme nice. and it's it's the um, it's a spinal disc from an ichthyosaur. I'm, I'm reliably informed. Wow, that's so cool. It, it, in the spirit of what you're saying, uh, Ruby, can, we, can I come to you, Ruby? <laughs> yeah, so I'm on the spot now. I need to demonstrate something on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> I can show everyone. The only thing I can demonstrate is not my desk, but is I'm going to slightly move the camera up. Can everyone see my lava lamp? Yeah. I've got a lava lamp up there, <laughs> which is every so often that will blob up. Okay, so if I get boring, pay attention to the uh, the lava lamp. <laughs> so um, one thing. I... <laughs> so one I'm thing I. Sorry, sorry what was that, Robina? No, I was just going to say, if I turned my screen, I could show you some real live llamas in the field that I can see them Ooh. from the window. Lovely. Interesting. <laughs> I, I Thank you. Pet. <laughs> very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so one of the things that we found in our teams, because we do a lot of um, Skype calls and a lot of video conferencing, is um, always to have about two or three minutes of small talk right at the very start. Okay, what have you been up to? What are you doing? How's your day? Oh, um, you know, that's a great shirt you're wearing today, Brian, or something or another. Um, and that small talk is a great icebreaker, especially if even if you still know the team and you're still aware of who they are. But uh, a funny story is I used to work with a Portuguese guy and he was often in the office in Newbury all the time, but the times he was not in the office, he would be on the video conference, on the Skype call, but he was dressed in, a, in his suit and tie, always, even though he was working from home. And what made it even more bizarre was he would wear his, um, his pass, his lanyard and his pass, okay. actually, nice. on the call as well. <laughs> so I just thought that was so bizarre. But we always spent about a good five minutes just laughing at that guy saying, you know, but you're not in the office. You're not going to go through any security gates. Why are you wearing your pass? But he said that's the way he rolled. But, you know, that, that that's good. Um, I think Whatever the word works. is... Also Exactly, yeah. And I, and I also think to the skills that Yasim talked about, um, if ever anyone's gone through a bit of media training, what you learn is on camera, your actions need to be a little exaggerated so you can convey those emotions a lot better. And um, I hope everyone's seeing our pictures because they're at the top of the screen where I am. And what I've learned is that when people are talking, although you're not talking, you can show those nonverbal signals by nodding or by actually you know, showing some kind of emotion mm. as well, even though you're not the person who's speaking. And that adds more to the physical interaction as well, which I find was a very good tip and it really does help. Mm. Well, I mean, that leads us nicely on to, to uh, one of our closing points here, which is what good practices or what interesting ideas have you seen so far? We're, we're still at the early stages of this being more widely done in society, aren't we? Perhaps, Rabina, I could ask you on that one. Um, I, well, because I work as a sort of freelance independent, in, independent person, 
Um, I'm guessing I've seen a lot of bad practice, but I haven't seen much good practice um, in the past. Okay. One thing I've seen recently is with the companies I work with, we've had a tradition of having cameras off because nobody has wanted to, um, you know, sort of put makeup on or put a decent shirt on or things like that. So that's been the tradition in the past. Um, but since coronavirus, yeah, we've all put our cameras on and we've said it doesn't matter if you're still in your PJs, just, you know, show your face. And it's been mm. a lot more relaxed. We're all in this together type scenario. Mm. And a building like what Ruby said, um, we've tried to do that with a, another business school I work with. Um, it may have been done in a little bit of a forced way, but I think it worked. And what we did, we all sent in pictures of our pets and we had a little competition at the end of the webinar in terms of trying to match pets to their owners to make it a little bit more, more fun and human. And that seemed to break some of the barriers down of a lot of people interacting that we didn't have a relationship and we'd never met, met before, but we were in the same boat working for the same company. And do, so, do, do owners land up looking like their pets, Rabina, from your experience of that competition? I'm not, I think you've got to know both the owners and the pets. And I think the problem with that was that most of us, we could see pictures of the pets, but we didn't know who the owners were and there was no pictures <laughs> of owners. <laughs> okay. Oh, good practice that you've seen. Yet. Husband, sorry, Rabina. Sorry. My husband looks like his llama, I would say that. <laughs> They're both tall, dark, handsome, and somewhat aloof and standoffish. So there's, there's a similarity there. Sounds good, thank you. You see, what, can I ask what you've seen in terms of good practice or interesting ideas to um, 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 longer term? I, I, am, I am right there in between um, a play conference and uh, Unfortunately, it was going to be in the US, but now we are all remotely doing the conference. And because it's play, um, we actually just recently did a play workshop online. And it was really fun. Everybody showed on their cameras what they are doing and how they are creating their own thing, as if we are in the same room and taking pictures and um, making comments. So it kind of made it really almost real time. It almost made it feel. And also, the other good thing was, because it was recorded, usually it wouldn't be recorded that much. It kind mm. of actually collected more data. And, uh, and it's same, two weeks ago, I did a play workshop. It was pre-recorded, which I wish it was actually interactive, uh, online interactive. Um, but still, usually I wouldn't be able to collect that much data this time. I have so much more information. So I think there are some good things about it. Um, even though I would still prefer play to happen together because there are different sure. things that come out of it. But online also worked really well. Um, and Excellent. also, um, you know, um, going into different rooms on the Zoom, for example, you know, multiple rooms that you can actually meet mm. with other people and then go back to the big meeting. So that, they actually really work well. Okay, interesting. Ruby, what have you seen yeah. that sort of sparked your interest? I guess um, large organisations will have uh, very good collaboration tools, which are integrating all their business um, tools as well. So, and I think that that works well. Um, I mentioned uh, Workplace before, which um, really does help because it has the social element on there as well for companies to be able to, you know, jump on a hashtag, which uh, we, we've invented one, it's especially during COVID-19, making sure that everyone's okay. And we're all trying to be kind to each other as well, looking out for people in different countries and what they're up to. So being able to um, have that kind of blend again, I think is the good practice. The blend of the social element to the working practice always works well. Um, I've also seen in good practice a lot of conferences going online now in yeah. terms of, you know, because they can't physically meet together. And, you know, had we spoken to them about a year ago, it was a case of, oh, no, everything's going to be physical. We're all going to meet each other. We're all going to have workshops. 
and you know this this COVID nineteen, it's kind of like accelerated everyone to say they can go online. There's no excuses. We can do things. You know, hopefully the speeds and the broadband connections are going to be okay. But it has made people be a lot more inventive. Um, I've been invited to a hackers conference, so I'm going to see how that works out, and I'll be very sure. excited to see how we how we gel together with new people online. So I think it it's been um, kind of like a a new portal that we've opened it during the you know a crisis has caused some mm -hmm. good to come out of it and I, i'm so pleased that we can start to experiment and we can start to do uh, build new relationships through home working in a different way i'm not going to say it's the same way it's in a different way and all of us need to work at skills to make sure we can work from home in a very um, productive way well, I, you, you've given us some really interesting insights and examples there, folks. So what I'm going to do is just ask Martin to, to leap into the conversation. Martin, is there any questions we've had from the audience that we'd like to just um, feed through to our panel? We have indeed. Um, we've got um, one from a chap called uh, Peter Gale. Um, when working remotely, do you have any issues with lots of people trying to contact you at the same time via different mediums? Mm. We've got to take that one. <laughs> um, um, <You> see? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I had I had that issue. That's why it's kind of like a, it comes from so many different places. If you are using different social media, and then it ends up you everybody is contacting you from different places. You have to, I guess, you have to have a really nice contact information. Who is where do they live? It's almost like a it's a different geological thing. <laughs> it's the social geology in a way. Like you try to put them in your mind. And then if it's really important, then you give them email address and then so that you can actually collect them in one place. Otherwise, mm. you will forget, especially if you're an independent consultant, you will get a lot of people and then you it might get lost in between all of these. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts there, folks? I, I, I struck over somebody. Ruby? <laughs> no problem. Yes, I, I to answer the question. Yes, I get it all the time. Um, you can be happily working away in an architecture design. All of a sudden, um, a Skype IM will come in um, as an IM, and then it'll be a call comes in at the same time. So it's a case of you know having to deal with each of them separately. This this is my my way of doing it. Just to tell the person I'm a bit, bit busy on the IM, and I will get back to them. I think the worst I could do was just to leave them hanging on and ignore them. I don't, I'm not the sort of person that wants to do that. You know, I mean, uh, it, they're going to be internal calls or so, but um, you learn to multitask, dare I say, in terms of trying to partition things and mm. being able to keep things in a box. And I, do you know, I have a, a notebook, do, despite all of our techno wizardry we have as IT architects, I will still have a paper and pen here. And most of my paper and pen book is full of to-do lists. Okay, <laughs> every day I've got a to-do. And that's the way I manage to partition. If I need to deal with something that comes in at the same time, it's a juggling act, it really is. And that's why we need to take time to step away sometimes. And it goes back to my my issues about trying to get your emotional well-being and your mental health in check mm. and don't let that run away and we can't underestimate how important that is to us. What do you think about that, uh, Rubina, to trying to balance those things, all those different demands that you get now? I mean, uh, Martin maybe has also got in mind that I just uh, WhatsApp him a question while we were also having this conversation on um, <laughs> go to webinar. <laughs> I mean, I'm constantly getting phone calls at the same time, you know, on mobile and landline. I've tried to use my husband as my secretary to pick things up if I'm on the other call, but that hasn't worked. Um, <laughs> I just have to sort of let something go to answer machine and then get back to them as soon as I, I finish the call that, that I'm yeah. on. Um, the other thing is, you different people communicate in different ways, you know, and I've got some people who want to... Um, use WhatsApp, some people want to use Messenger, some who, who send a text message and it's remembering who prefers which form of communication which sometimes mm. can get um, annoying because you, you, you know you've had a message for it because it clicked up and you go through all these different forms of communication to find out which one they've, they've used. 
I do try and encourage people to use either text or email because that's what gets my attention. But then I have to remember to go through all the other channels just in yeah. case I've missed something that is yeah. important. What have you got next for us, Martin? Um, Richard Stevens um, asks, he's, he's um, I think he's a, a solo worker, but he asks, um, the hidden assumption behind the presenter, presenters is that people are working remotely, but as part of an organisation, a larger organisation. Mm. So um, what about people who work for themselves by themselves? Rabina, I think that applies to you, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I work for myself, by myself. Um, so... <laughs> I guess for me, um, home is my office anyway, so there's, there's no change there, other than I've got a lot less work to do now because mm. most, of, most of my work is upfront training and I do experiential learning, which is not easy to do online scenario. So most sure. of my work has been postponed until further notice. Um, there's some courses that we are doing online and those are the ones for a qualification so I'm trying to adapt my material at the moment to doing it online. Um, the other thing I've noticed is that I'm in a few networking groups because I work on my own and I do like physical interaction with people that I belong to a number of networking groups and locally, which I really enjoy meeting those over a bottle of wine in the evening. Now mm. we're doing those online and we had a, a Zoom one last night and we all had a bottle of wine in that's wine in front of us to so try and make yeah. it as we would face to face. But some of our members used to have one bottle each. <laughs> yep, we had a bottle each. Um, but some of our members were not comfortable with the technology, so we lost people, which was unfortunate um, mm. because they just didn't feel that they could cope with the technology of doing it online. So I think yeah. some of it reaching out to other people in your situation that might be on their own or not feeling comfortable with this and don't, don't have the support of a large organisation to reach out yeah. and say, are you okay? Can I talk you through this? Can I give you a hand? And to try and make sure that they're included in this That's new cool. world we find ourselves in. Okay. I, I work for myself also um, and on my own. And it's been 10 years, <laughs> so it's, it's, you learn Exactly how Robina said, it's the exact same. You go into so many different networks and then some of them are actually maybe um, support groups, for example, freelancer support groups or consultant mm. support groups. So, yeah. I mean, I do have so many different people that I'm interacting with, um, but that's how I was doing it from the beginning because otherwise you become very alone. I mean, yes. and yeah. you learn how to interact and find your own hobbies, actually, the things that you really love, that it doesn't require people. I mean, okay. especially in this time, it helps, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Martin, another question? Um, what have we got? Um, from Julie Oxley. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find you don't take many breaks when you work from home? How do you maintain physical exercise? How do you keep fit? Interesting question. Go on, Ruger. I can see you want to take that one. <laughs> well, I'm not going to swing the camera around, but there are some kettle bells on the floor just behind me, <laughs> which are gathering dust. Doesn't mean to say I use them all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a very good question. We do need breaks, you know, and it's not just breaks during our lunch break. We need to have a break, you know, just a short breather to stand up at a chair and just go visit the kitchen, get a glass of water, come back and do those things. You know, it's nothing worse than conference calls after conference calls after conference calls. They, they are more mm. detrimental to our health than, you know, us doing different things that wouldn't help either. Um, I think I, I'm the sort of person, I hate to say it, but I start the day with yoga, okay, and a bit of meditation, a bit of trying to get myself into deep breathing and ready. Um, I'm also the sort of person that can suffer from cabin fever. 
if I've mm. been in a room for too long, I need some fresh air, I need to open this window, by the way. Um, it's those sorts of things, you know, do step away every so often. And you should be the one that's under control. Don't let anyone control you to say, we're going to have this call this time. You know, you can easily say, can you make it five minutes later? You know, can I step away at this yeah. moment in time? Always remember, you need to be in control of your own situation. and it, and everyone you know on this earth should have some compassion towards the situation we're in now and how we need to work now which is most important so yes be in control take your breaks you need them to revitalize your batteries well that's lovely Look, um we, we, we we're on 44 minutes now i said it'd be 45 so perhaps i could ask just one of you for just for, for one last little comment perhaps something inspirational or something you'd like to see uh, as we continue with this um, uh, unusual situation at the moment, uh, just to finish off, um, Yesim, could we start with you? Any closing comments you'd like to make? Um, I think because I'm a play expert, so that's what I'm going to say is, I think you should keep your playfulness, even in this, especially in this situation, that's kind of your savor in a way. Um, yes. And it's a, it's a great way of adapting and evolving from that. So keep the playfulness, try to keep the playfulness within yourself. Lovely, thank you. Rubina? Um, I would just say that there's a lot of people who are actually living on their own at the moment and will be in total isolation. So just pick up the phone to somebody with no particular agenda. But if you do know somebody who is living on their own, just pick up the phone and just have a conversation with them, not about work, but just about how they are and just trying to brighten their day. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Ruby? I think I may have got it wrong, but hopefully the sentiment won't be lost. Um, I was reading somewhere that um, during the 18th century, um, one of the great scientists, Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton, I think it was during the plague or some great historic event, could not go outside and had to stay in his house. And during that time, he invented, um, you know, all those wonderful scientific uh, explorations into gravity and all those kinds of, you know, scientific, um, you know, things that we use today. I don't even know what they are, but they are amazing what uh, Sir Isaac Newton did. But it was just the case that, you know, whilst we're stuck inside, we can still be inventive and we can still work with each other and we can still talk to each other, whether by phone or whether by M. And these social media tools will help us. You know, they will really help us to stay in touch. We're not going to be purely in isolation. We can still help each other. Um, that's my last few words, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Yasin, Rabina and Ruby, have really appreciated your time today and your comments. They've been really uh, insightful. Uh, we'd like to thank the audience for uh, the questions they sent in as well. This recording will be on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, we'll do a little bit of an editorial overview of it as well on Friday, so look out for that on the BCS website. As you can see on your screens, next week we have uh, another uh, webinar. We'll have a different panel next week. We're talking about security, uh, info security in a, in a COVID-19 world, which is a, an entirely different subject. But um, can we say thank you very much uh, and uh, please get nominating for your uh, who you consider to be vital IT workers that have done a good job and uh, we'll bring this uh, to a close. Thank you very much.